Hi everyone. We all know that small populations have big problems. And I want to talk to you about one of those problems and, and the way that we characterize that in population models. So the Ali effect is a situation where the mean individual fitness is lower at small population sizes or in low density populations than what we would expect otherwise. This is one type of density dependent effect. A lot of times when we think about density dependent effects, we think about things like starvation and crowding. But this is what happens when density gets too low to support good population growth. So it just really occurs at lower densities. This graph is a great way to represent what's going on in the population. So the blue line traces population growth at different densities. So the X is densities, Y is the population growth. And the red line is that same population. The rest of the model's the same, but they've added in a Lee effect. So small populations grow less than large populations, and they're, they're less able to keep up with the growth. So you'll notice that some of the parameters are the same, right? They both top out at a thousand individuals, but the big difference is here when that population is small. So what causes the so-called Ali effect? Well, there are a couple of things. Mate limitation is one way, right? So if individuals can't find one another to mate, and, and this is assuming a eukaryotic sexual population, but if you can't find a mate, you can't make babies. Sometimes organisms modify the environment and so much so that they have a positive impact on one another. If you can't make that environment a good, happy, healthy place for you and others like you, your population is not going to be growing. Some other organisms have cooperative defense mechanisms, whether that's schooling in fishes or alarm calling. There are lots of ways that individuals of a species wind up protecting one another by sharing that same area. In other cases, there's cooperative food gathering. So that could be things like pack hunting or communal webs for spiders. So Kramer and colleagues did a recent review, well, not so recent now, um, looking at evidence for a Lee effects across different taxonomic groups. For example, fishes, birds, mammals, aquatic invertebrates, and terrestrial arthropods. And that's what's shown on the top here. And then they looked at various mechanisms that would lead to those Ali effects. Things like mate limitation, cooperative defense, predator satiation. Basically, the predators are, are done consuming that group and that, that you needed a certain number of individuals to to make the predators full and go away. Um, cooperative breeding, which is different than mate limitation in the sense that these are organisms who have some sort of a behavior that makes mating rituals more effective uh, when done as a group. Cooperative feeding, um, dispersal, various forms of habitat alteration, and, and unknown. So there's an Ali effect there, but we don't know what's causing it. And as you can see, in the years since the Lee effects have, have been described, their importance has, has increased. And I think what's interesting about this graph is that it captures the different ways that a Lee effect can be important for different groups of organisms. For example, this idea has been applied to invasive species in conservation contexts through biocontrol 
So our ability to control some organisms using others. Uh, in understanding pest species, as well as in better understanding how we can harvest wild populations for various human uses. A lot of the work that's been done has also been basic research without one of those particular goals stated um, in, in that work. So there's a really wide range of applications of, Ali, of the idea of a Lee effect. Another way to look at this is that there's a whole range of Lee effects. So you could have a population that's growing just as, as we might predict with a very simple population model, like the logistic model. And that's represented by the black line. High growth at small rates, <clears throat> high per capita growth at small um, population densities, and then decreasing as you approach carrying capacity, and eventually the population has negative growth when it crosses carrying capacity, and there's not enough room for all the individuals. Or it meets carrying capacity and stops growing. There's the idea that there can be a weak Lee effect, where there's still positive population growth, and that's represented by the green line. Represented by the red line here, is a much stronger Lee effect. And one of the things that I really love about this figure from the Dos Santos paper is that it shows the link between different, different processes that are happening in that population and that are represented by these kinds of models. So on the left-hand side of the inset, it shows cooperation. So these are, these are population densities where cooperation is helping the population to build or is, is otherwise required and not being fulfilled. And then on the other side here is competition. This is where we're starting to fill up the carrying capacity and there starts to be negative um, density dependent effects. So there are positive density dependent effects going on on this side or that are required on this side and there are negative density dependent effects on this side. So we know that as we start to apply this to real situations having no Ali effect it helps to have more individuals that has to do with stochasticity it, it has to do with um, a number of other ideas. But if you introduce a small number of individuals, whether that's in an invasive species context or in, a, or in trying to reestablish species, that it's going to be difficult for those species to colonize and, and start building a population. As we add more individuals, it gets more and more likely that that population establishes. So that's that top line indicated by the no Ali effect. A weak Ali effect makes it a little bit harder for those populations to establish, and a strong Ali effect can sometimes make an S-shaped curve where there's essentially a threshold above which we need to get in order for those species to, to establish and to take off. And like I said, that can be applied to both positive and negative contexts in the sense that there are some organisms that we'd like to, to have establish and maintain a population, right? Things like endangered species, things like harvested populations, and then there are pests and invasive species where we would like to see those populations remain low. And we would like for those populations to not be self-reproducing. All right. So what? Well, we see, for example, in conservation contexts that group size is important and the probability of losing a population, uh, and in this case, meerkats, was higher when we had smaller group sizes. As group size increased, there's a positive effect. Those individuals are, are helping one another out in one way or another. 
and that supports the population growing. There are other examples, um, and this one is a weekly effect from musk oxen. And what we can see is that there's, there's a smaller growth at smaller population densities. As those population densities increase, the population starts to take off. We see a stronger effect in, um, in one of the marmot studies that that's cited in the Dos Santos paper. And I think that that helps to demonstrate um, some, of, some of the concerns with low populations. So all of these are graphs that I hope to help you to not so much focus on individual examples, but instead help you to see the patterns in data that, that would reflect an Lee effect being present. So, here we are. This is where the information came from. And I just want to remind you that like a lot of wildlife populations, we might just be in this together. Thanks.